Episode six, Anarchy Roundtable. Return of the Sith. <laughs> Once we get to seven, then we'll be done with the Star Wars theme. Is yeah, that no, so no, no, Joe. It will never end until Star Wars ends, <sighs> and Star Wars will never end. You should just. Have you guys seen the last episode? It's fucking awesome, except for the last fucking spoiler no, alert. Spoiler no, alert. Wait, don't be spoiling. I didn't see it. Well. I the did not. Falcon does. Uh, I, got I love the movie, except I did not like the way it ended. The Millennium Falcon. The best part of that entire movie is Millennium Falcon doing um, uh, drifting. It's drifting in air. The women were way too Disney. Uh, I mean, Star Wars was never all that sexy, but the women were extremely Disney. I thought Natalie Portman was pretty sexy. No, she, she was a dull character. What do you think? But they intentionally made moves to rip clothes off her. Like, okay. Like when they're in a scene in the in the um Coliseum. You didn't see the movie. Oh, I'm talking about the first like episode two or something like that. Oh. They were in the scene. With, why are we talking about Star Wars? Because uh, it's a libertarian concept. <laughs> Han Solo is the epitome of right. agorism. Okay. All right. M- make a case for He's anarchy like, and and Star Wars. Well. I would like to associate uh, the rebellion with the anarchists, even though I know that's not what they're really geared up to do. However, when you look at uh, Han Solo, who is a pirate and a traitor, not a traitor in the context like someone with a D, a traitor with a D. Yeah, traitor. Yeah. Um, he's he's out to get his own. He's out to be successful. He, dri- he drives a nice... I mean, it's a piece of shit, but by the same token, it's kind of a nice rig. Yeah, it is. And, like... So, to, to that end, I kind of said, like, well, Han Solo is an agorist. He's always making deals. He's always getting his own way. He lives his own life in the galaxy, kind of outside of the Empire and the Rebellion. So, I can't fault him. He's, he's, he's an individualist. All right. I, I, can, I can say that. Well, he's with Chew, Chewy, so... Really yeah. But he, they have the same Actually, I was listening to the law on the way here, and this is the reason why I'm pushing on the individualist. Bastiat actually came up with a really good point in 1850 when they wrote this. I can't believe this was written in 1850. It sounds like it could have been written. Star Wars was, was written in 1850. No. 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 I love play. Say what he's saying. It sounds like it's actually. Okay. He's actually got a good point. From Frederick Bastiat, 1850, the law. He was saying that us um, free market anarchical types were not individualists. We're essentially voluntarists. He didn't use that word, but what he meant was we are often in favor of group association. Um, you know, we want to go into business, we want to have partnerships, we want to have communities. What we don't want to have is violence backed, forced association. We're not individualists. We're Voluntarists. Yeah. Well, individuals yeah. don't necessarily uh, don't necessarily shun cooperation with others. Well, they, 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 do, they do what they do with the Yeah. So um, an individualist would be like one guy, like out trying to. Why is that? How did that come on, Dan? I. It was, Turn it off. I can't. Okay. Off. Okay. Here we go. Mission accomplished. Right. Okay. No, I, I think it's an important Thank distinction. You, to distinguish between an individualist well, would be like know, somebody who's push. trying to... Hey, fuck you. <laughs> one, one person, man. I'm trying. I'm trying to make this work, Joe. All right. But you, you just... You, you keep you keep pushing on me, and so many layers... And... Don't sound like such a bitch. <laughs> I don't like that. It was one of Dan's voice. I love that. That was, that, that was well done, <laughs> Joe. Sorry. I was going to call you James for us. You call everybody James. <laughs> it's basically anyone that has a, a J at the front of their name. All right. J, Jones, James, No, no They're all kind of same. I mean, ind- individualist would really mean somebody who's like trying to like do like his business, his life, all on his own, his own or her own. We're, that's not what we're after. We're after um, cooperation and all this. I think Bastiat had a point. And I think it's worth... Um, I think individuals can can uh, cooperate with other people, but they tend to go their own way, but, they, but they're not afraid to cooperate. 
and go along with other people if it's in their best interest? Well, I think, no. Uh, you are forced in a situation where you kind of have to cooperate with people that aren't really within your best interest. Right. I would argue that, and mind you, it's not that I think businesses are inherently bad, but businesses are there to, to make a profit, correct? Which is good. It's good, but by the same token, do you really think Taco Bell gives a shit about you? Probably not. Well, probably they not. have to. That's, that's the whole. That's, Taco Bell's not a person, though. The There's thing a is, person here where they give a shit about that's you. Adam Amen. Smith's uh, observation is: we is when we uh, want our dinner, we do not look to the uh, to the benevolence of the butcher or the baker no, or, yeah. or the brewer, but to his interests. We don't we don't tell him how pathetic and hungry we are. We give him shit. money. Yeah, yeah. You know? but that's the thing. Is like that's when. when when someone sits there and says, well, um, you know, we're, uh, we expect the market to always be, not always be, but generally benevolent. No, it, it really isn't. And at no point, I like, don't get me wrong, I love the market. I love the viciousness of the market. How Apple can just stomp over Microsoft within an hour. Oh, no, See, there's nothing vicious about that. Well, customers are not property. No, and I agree with you. What I mean, what I mean in viciousness is, like, at times, you're talking about Schrodinger's creative destruction. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, just the quickness, the the the, the cutthroat of it. It's fascinating. It's interesting to watch. But when I, I when I take it down to an individual level, I do wonder. And I brought this up before, and I think another episode. Um, I kind of wonder how much is that taken into place in terms of uh, individual relations outside. I won't say outside the market necessarily, but outside of um, what we'd consider conventional market. Like, everyone here agrees that we're only hanging out and friends because it's beneficial, correct? Certainly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. because yeah. nobody's forcing us to get together. Right. So of course it's beneficial. Yeah. We want to be here. Yeah. But you understand that that implies a, 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 like a social trade, right? Yeah. It also implies then. This is why I see it. It seems like commodification of the human, of the individual. Like, we're just, we can be sold and bought based, not necessarily on monetary value, Only but you. like, shut up. <laughs> Wait, you said I had to lean in to get on the camera? <laughs> but like, the, like the, the social value that each one of us holds. And... I, I, I kind of sit there like, I, I, you see this, you see people who climb the, the ladder in terms of sociability to get to the top, there's not a lot of them, politicians are generally the most common form of this, but you see it with movies, celebrities and everything, so it, there's, there's, there's a sense, a lot more common than you think, there's a sense that like when I, when I ride through Taco Bell or Wendy's and you know I get a burger, I don't give a shit about the woman's name that's serving me, I don't really give a shit if she's got six kids. And I kind of wonder, to what level... Sometimes you do. To what level is that applicable to even people that you consider close? Hmm. I don't know. It's just a thought. Well, I guess... I mean, to some extent, I would say that everybody operates all the time out of self-interest. Uh -huh. But I also fo follow uh, Heinlein in defining love as that state where the well-being of another becomes essential to our own. So the thing is, when you actually care about a person, doing something for them is doing something for yourself. Right. Because if they're not doing well, you won't be as, as happy. And we have some level of that for, ev for everybody. I mean, if somebody dragged a random stranger in here and started waterboarding his ass, even without knowing enough, we would we would love him enough not to be able to tolerate watching him get waterboarded in the living room. We would probably get up and beat up whoever it was that was waterboarded. But you're also making an interesting. Uh, well, this is something I've also discussed before. Is that uh, does empathy really exist outside of our sight? Yeah, um, definitely. It, I think I think really. Are you really, 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 really concerned about the people that are unemployed in Nevada? Not right necessarily. No, but if somebody I loved was in Nevada yeah. and unemployed, then I would certainly be concerned about that person. No, um, I'm I'm more concerned about unemployed people in New Hampshire. 
But, but there, there, there's, there's, a, there more of there's a hierarchy of what, who you care about. I mean, yeah. There and and that's where I differ with Jesus. Don't, don't love your neighbor as you love yourself. You're supposed to love yourself more. You're supposed to put more effort into protecting your own children than you put into protecting somebody else's children. But as far as the hierarchy... I do say that. No. Jesus disagrees. Okay, fuck Jesus. He just he agrees with Jesus. What, that, no, the reason, I'm just crawling his ass because everyone knows. But no, there is a, there's uh, a, a, a definite hierarchy of how much you care about people. And a really good example of this I heard 20, 30 years ago. I was listening to WABX, and um, they, uh, it was when that guy uh, killed the abortion doctor. He was hiding in the woods in North Carolina or something. Mm-hmm. And he was like, um, the DJ comes out, you know, does this, oh yeah, and, uh, uh, 10, 000, that's what he said, 10,000 people died in an earthquake today in Zaire, that's what he said, and then he goes, this is what the fucked up part of it, he goes, and on a more serious note, people, did you hear me, Danny, he goes, the DJ goes, 10,000 people died in an earthquake in Zaire today, and he goes, and on a more serious note, 10,000 people just died. Uh, what's more serious than 10,000 people dying? Well, of course, they were black. 20 million. So. No, 10,000 people died in an earthquake. But on a more serious note, that so-and-so, uh, the guy who killed the abortion doctor, has been hiding in the woods in North Carolina, and people have actually been helping him. And that's mm. that people have been helping this killer, and it's a more serious note. It's just like, oh, my God, I could not believe that. It. It's like, I wish I had, like, a... Well, you know, it's because it's like that whole... Fear factor thing, you know, 10,000 people die, it's a statistic. One guy is hiding in the woods because he killed someone, you know, that's a story, and that's something you can relate to, and it's, you know, maybe you're threatened because maybe he could kill you, you know what I mean? It's, but it's, 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 yeah. it's like, the thing is, it's, to me, that's just normal, yeah. because humans grew up in tribes, okay? Yeah. And everybody looks, I, I mean, evolved in, in tribes. Everybody looks at, dogs look at their own packs yeah. differently than they look at, at other packs. So we're you in know, trouble. I'm, if, if something bad happens to somebody in, in New Hampshire, if it's not a free stater, I'm somewhat relieved. So there's not somebody I know that somebody that something bad. So it's cool that you're defining your own pack. Yeah. But what I find disturbing and it is that the governments of the world tend to hijack this innate part of us that you're talking about. Yeah. And people feel a sense of connection to the people who live inside the imaginary lines on the map. That were drawn by armies coming together and only and reaching stalemate. So the people who live in Detroit have more um, feeling of um, camaraderie with the people who live in Sacramento than they do with the people who live in Windsor, a great or, or, which is in view of Detroit, or on the west side, east side. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I think that's somewhat it, un- unnatural. Yeah. I think normally it would be. Uh, I, more I think of another a aspect of this. Uh, it, it lies at the root of racism is mm. how can you be well racist is you can look at someone who's different than you say they're a different mm. color and you can think of them as not being human or not well you treat me like that all the time well, see, to me, if, it's not because you're black. But if, if you look at yourself, if you look at yourself as a black man or a white man, you're likely. A lot of it depends on how how you think about it. If you think of yourself as a black man or a white man, then you're basically saying my my tribe is is yeah, myself I mean, and other black men or myself and other white men. Well, like during slavery, or, and I see but this if even. you look at yourself as a human. Instead of an American or right. a white man or or a, or a Caucasian, well, then is, humanity becomes your trap. There's a hierarchy because you yeah. say if there if there were ETs or whatever, you would say, well, they're they're not, they're an alien. They're not they're not human. You would look down on them. Well, and then you would say, but I might tend, I might still like them better than Republicans. Say, you never know. Well, I'm just saying, but they they need. They need then you can break it down to where, well, we're both humans. It's like a Star Trek episode where they were like half blue and half white, but 
they were blue on one side and the other people were blue on the other side and they're like mm -hmm. why do you hate him he looks the same oh, can't you tell they're blue on the other side opposite on the right. left side and, uh, I love that but you can take you can take like say white people could look and black at black people or chinese people or whatever this is a i think a relatively new concept within the last couple hundred years and they can look at them and say well they're they're subhuman they're not human they're they're not uh, so then you can break it down to say, well, like you said, East, you know, they're from a different country. They don't speak our culture. And then you can break it down to say, well, they're from a different state, or they, they follow a different team, or you can get into Detroit, and you can say East Side, West Side, you know, or you, I mean, you can break it down so far where everybody should hate everybody. There was that, my ex wife from Mexico, and I. Said something about somebody. Blonde haired, blue eyed bastard. Yeah, so I what? said something about somebody one time and she was like, Well, why don't you like her? She goes, Well, she's Rancho. I'm like, What are you talking about, Rancho? You know? Rancho's, yeah. Okay. Like, redneck. Yeah. She goes, Well, she lives in a ranch. I go, She lived like a mile away. Well, yeah, but they were in a ranch, you know. But I mean, but I mean, you could just break it down where everybody should hate everybody. Well, personally, okay, here's, besides that, I find this kind of interesting, and this is a thing I, um, I find, um, I, I see libertarians on both sides of this issue. One side, and this is regarding the uh, immigration of, uh, of Mexicans into the United States. Um, w the right side, it seems kind of like Cantwell-ish, will argue uh, property rights in the strictest sense. So, like, if you have a bunch of farmers who all sit on the border, who have property lines up against Mexico's border, um, Mexicans should be, uh, not should, but they're subject to the rules of uh, the property owner at that point. Once they jump that line and get into the farm, they're subject to the rules and regulations for that particular farm. So if the, shooter, if the farm owner wants to shoot these people jumping over the fence into their, into a lot, I, I can see that as I can see that as a, a valid point, but but, I but that's tough. simple trespassing. It doesn't have anything to do with what nationality. No, no, no. I understand that. I understand that completely. Mm -hmm. but, but, but and this is why I said if there's a line of farms up against the border, quote unquote, mm -hmm. um, I can see why that might be a much more than just trespassing when you are up at the very front line now. By the same token, I also think work employees should, should, you know, be able to cross borders without issue. I guess the, the real complication I see is, should people who are seeking work be allowed to trespass over land that has already been claimed? And then that brings into the question of... Who owns the land? You know, where does ownership end? Does ownership go straight down into the earth? Does it go straight up into the sky? Can they fly over the top? Can they fly over a, in a drone and look down at you? It, it brings into the old debate, if you own a piece of property and somebody claims all the land around your piece of property, are you marooned on your land and you can never leave? Um, I don't think that's going to happen too much. Um, well, but it could happen. I mean, yeah, but even yeah, no, 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 no. The market's going to figure that out. We, we, I don't what? know. There's, there's uh, in the affairs of nations, there is a uh, a tradition that a blockade is considered an act of war. If you blockade somebody's harbor, um, well, you. Yeah. But if you blockade somebody's harbor, you've you've addressed against them. At least that's how it's concerned. Well, so I think the market for law would probably work well, this out. Yeah, uh, I, I yeah. am curious to see if it actually could, because you have two very very uh, strong idea uh, ideas running up against each other. You have one that's saying maintain property rights almost to an extreme level, but and the other side is so they're saying well. Um, I want to work, I want to be employed, I want to be a productive individual. Well, and these two ideas are kind of at odds. If I, I don't want to be the ANCOM here, but I, I, do find, I do find it interesting. Like, how do you really, like, I, I've heard Robert Murphy discuss this. How do you really get around the issue of, 
property and people stepping onto your property. Like, stuff in mind you makes point, oh, no one would shoot each other, but no, they actually they have. Do. They, they do, they do it now. Um, I, I really, are you familiar with the way law emerges in a free market for law society? It's Stephen common Kinsella. law. Well, there's common law and there's also Roman law. Stephen Kinsella was recently on uh, the Tom Woods show again. He did. We just talked about the contract episode. Um, I think it was in episode four. We were talking about. Uh, he, he was on there talking about contracts, but he was on here again a few episodes later. I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, talking about the emergence of law, he was contrasting edicts and statutes of states. How it's been, how it's trumped the emergence of law. It was very interesting how he talked about the way law comes about in the common law system that you talked about and in the Roman law system. Well, and it was very similar. And it's only been in recent history that states have taken over and supplanted this process of creating law. No, I just And um, by right. recent, I mean compared to like so many thousands. Well, of years. no, but really, it's um, not kind of recent. Whatever, whatever. The first legal code was Hammurabi, so that was. Quite a while ago. You got to consider that all these dictators throughout, throughout the history the laws were limited. I think is what he's saying. Yeah, even yeah. they had they were subject to the law hmm. a lot of times. Well, that had. Uh, if you're a dictator, how much law are you actually subject to? Honestly, if you're feral, really. You know, they were limited in power much more so than later um, dictators by the power of all of the barons and everybody um, that was within their, their realm. Priests yeah, or whatever. Priests, uh, there was a lot of checks. The, the, the total totalitarian... The, the, um, um, totalitarian state didn't really emerge until the 20th century. Well, there's yeah. only been one... There's only been, what, three or four handfuls? Like, honestly, there really has not been a lot of totalitarian governments. No. Um, but I think a lot of these it's points, very difficult to make a lot of these difficult, difficult points, people don't seem to realize uh, that even if uh, anarchy were to take hold and we, we lived in an anarchic society, there, there's still going to be wars and conflicts and aggression. Yeah. But well, if you read, like, I've read a lot of, uh, yeah, I, a I, lot I, of, uh, and about the War of the Roses, and the thing that did control them to some extent was public opinion. They had a crude form of democracy going in that when it came time for people to fight over over the throne, you had a choice as to who to ally yourself with, uh, both which noble you're going to follow, and you know you can choose a noble who's following either, either side. If you're a peasant, if you're a noble, you can choose to support any candidate for king. So it's a form of democracy. It's just democracy with swords. You go out and kill each other, and whoever's left wins. I said before, and I think, you know, there are a lot of good things to be said about democracy, and I think as far as the good things about democracy, I think the ultimate form of democracy is, is the market. You know, market laissez-faire capitalism is the ultimate form of democracy because the people that care about whatever happens are the people that decide what happens. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the market, if there's, you oh, know, the good and things... Your money and, the yeah, thing that makes good. it different from, from democracy, though, is in democracy, the choice of the majority is forced on the minority. In an, in an economy... In a free market. Uh, in, in, in a, a free market, maybe democracy you get like what you buy, life. and if your neighbor wants something different, he can go out and buy something yeah. different. Yeah, um, I, I, and not that's the proper word, nice but I think, about it. like I said, the, 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 the good feelings we have about a way of allocating, yeah. of, of allocating power, yeah. is but what the rather than... Is best. Yeah, well, rather than one man, one vote, it's whenever you do a good turn for somebody in capitalism and he pays you for it, you accumulate a few more votes and you can use those votes on whatever you want. They're dollars. You can spend them on <coughs> anything. I think we should ask Rich the button question. We haven't... Oh, the button question? Wait, wait, wait. So when it, when it comes to law, one thing that would be very different in a free market system is you wouldn't have a judge imposed upon you by voters or by appointment 
of yeah. someone who was voted for. If you're in a trial against someone else, like say somebody did a crime against you or they infringed upon your property and you decide instead of killing each other, you're going to go to a court, you would have to agree on who your judge is. Well, Where today we have a judge that's imposed upon you and mm -hmm. then the rules of the court are determined by this person who you didn't agree to be judged by. Somebody else can mm -hmm. sue you in this court or the state can prosecute you in this court and you have no choice on who that judge is. And then the judge controls all of the information that the jury gets. And mm -hmm. there, there is no possibility of a fair trial mm -hmm. under the American system or any system, it's not just the American system, it's, it's around the world basically. Mm -hmm. Well, there are no perfect yeah. systems uh, anywhere. No. What I would expect to happen under anarcho-capitalism is I would expect that somebody was when when somebody was harmed uh, to by a third party, he would call his insurance company generally, and he would say, "Hey, I had somebody broke into my house and jacked my stereo." His insurance company would be responsible for paying him, yeah, and then but, if his insurance company could locate the person that did it, they could then recover damages um, but what if from you, the thief. What if, you if were, somebody comes after you accusing you of a crime, chances are that if you if you're holding insurance, chances are the, the the procedure would be for their insurance to call your insurance company and say, hey, let's work this out. Because you know if they just go in and 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 you know try to kidnap you out of your house, you're going to call your insurance company, and then there's going to be a standoff going on at, at your house. Yeah. So what, what seems more likely is that the two insurance companies would get together and your insurance company would more or less be your advocate. But what about the uninsured? What about what if somebody breaks into your house and you call your insurance company and your insurance company goes after this person and this person said, well, you know, he kidnapped my daughter and I went to get her back or, you know, whatever. What if, you know... I don't know. I guess nothing's going to be. I would assume, um, and of course, this is something that That's would be determined by the market. Like, I mean, but if I was writing insurance company uh, in insurance policies for somebody in 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 an ANCAP state, I would certainly have some acts that you could write that you could commit that would void your insurance. Like so if somebody comes into your house and wastes you because you raped their kid, I'm gonna say, oh, okay, well, the value of your life was zero, so no ward, sorry, um, <laughs> because Good point. you're a frigging pedophile. Um, so that's kind of, as a matter of fact, you know, the guy, might, the guy who killed you might qualify for, for a reward. reward yeah. You know? yeah, that's a good point, I didn't thought about that. So it looks like Danny might not be coming back. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. um, so we didn't introduce ourselves at the start of this episode. Wow. We're, we're six episodes in. And we're we're still, soberer than the last we're, one. We're, we're still working this out. <laughs> well, I think me and Joe are still about the same spot we were last <laughs> You're like, definitely sober. -er. You're definitely sober. That's uh, so, true. I, I'm Joe. I'm Mike. That I'm was Rich. Danny who was sitting there. And, yes, we have no Danny. Yeah, and say again because I was talking over you. And I'm Rich. All right. And now. Uh, Rich is visiting here from the Free State Project. Yeah. And he is in the uh, Status Recovery Pool House. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is the Status Recovery House? No. Status Recovery Pool. <laughs> oh, okay. Right there, out there. Yeah, we got yeah, the pool. Here. We'll get some footage of the pool after. We're going yeah, swimming okay. after this. Through the window. You can't see it. I told you you couldn't. It's dark out. Um, we got some people outside swimming right now. But, um, you. You, you do, um, what, Free Talk Live? I do Free Talk Live. Uh, I founded the Church of the Invisible Hand. Oh, we got to talk what about the Church, the Church of the, of the Invisible, Invisible Hand. Hand. That's what I want to talk about last episode. I don't know what that is. Um, before things that. went awry. Okay. I like it. I like, <laughs> it. I like the name. Let me, let me get the, right. the, the camera re-going here for you. We stop it. And then... So, what is the Church of the Invisible Hand? Here we go. Well, the Church of the Invisible Hand is a uh, is a religion that I came up with when I was in jail, oh, okay. and uh, you know it's it's 
something that I've been working on it longer. It kind of came together while I while I was in jail. You have a little time on your hands. I, I had a lot. Give you time for you know, and I, again, and I, I am very sorry that you know. Nobody tried to rape you. I, I know that was really, really traumatic to you. So, uh, so basically, the uh, uh, the idea behind it is our estimated profits, and we call them estimated profits because they, uh, nobody knows everything. Nobody's right about everything, and they include people like Murray Rothbard and Anne Rand and. Uh, um, oh, by profits you mean. With the PAs. Yes, the prophets of the church. The yes, no, prophets of right, the no, church. James is prophet. Um, is a prophet of our... Okay. Um, and so, basically, scientists, economists, because, you know, basic, the, the belief of the Church of the Invisible Hand is that the, uh, the only expression of the Creator, if there is one, is within the laws of nature. And so what we should do is study the universe that we live in and figure out how to live in it best. And we should listen to the scientists and the uh, philosophers and the economists who, uh, you know, to the extent that we believe they're correct. But we also say, you know, don't take the Church's word that by by calling somebody a, a, a prophet that everything they wrote is right. All we're saying is read their stuff and figure out um, for, for yourself what's right. It's, it's an open source religion in that people are, are encouraged if they disagree with well, something. the first the, open source religion. I, well, I don't know when you started yours. Uh, about a year ago. I think you beat us. I, I was, probably was by a little yeah, bit. You're the so, machinist. The machinist. Prophet James. The machinist. Um, you know. no. <laughs> so, so, you know, the idea is if there's something in the way I do it that you disagree with, then, you know, subclass it and replace what you don't like. Yeah. Um, and that, uh, because, you know, like I say, nobody has a, uh, a corner on the market for truth. The, instead of a cross, our symbol is a question mark. Um, oh, I like it. Like it. <laughs> you may convert. Yeah, well, we'd, we'd be glad to have you. Um, and one of the things that the uh, church sponsors is what's called the way of the hand, which is... Paying taxes is inherently uh, is inherently sim, uh, sinful Sin, yeah. because what you are doing is you are paying for violence against uh, innocent people, uh, whether it's uh, pot smokers or Arabs or black folks or Mexicans or Yourself. white people. It's always somebody. They're always harming somebody with the money that you give them. You're so the violence. We, so yeah. we basically hold it a sin to pay taxes to any government that initiates force against its citizens. Which is the definition of government, in a, um, in a sense. Well, I've never seen a government that didn't initiate force yeah. against its citizens. So Otherwise, it would be a voluntary association. It wouldn't be a government exactly. or a state, if you prefer. So if you're allowed to practice your religion, then you should not be forced to pay taxes. Uh, well, yes, that's true. And the other thing is we uh, we do our best to practice, uh, to, to live by agorism. So we don't have to uh, interact with the state. I, I will not pay taxes to the entity that imprisoned me. I don't want that done to somebody else. You know, it's a bad thing to do to people. I've experienced it. I didn't like it. And so, you know, I find ways to make money off the books through, through agorism. And that's how I live. And I will not take a, uh, take a tax job unless they agree to ex exempt me from withholding. So tell me about the organization of your church. Do you have people who are like, um, organizers and then the members or, is there a leadership structure, or is it completely decentralized? How does that work? Do people right, donate? 
Right now, I'm pretty much the leadership. I do okay. have uh, some saints and some holy men, and uh, a saint is defined as somebody who donates a hundred dollars a month or a thousand dollars a year, wow. and a holy man is defined as somebody who defines ten dollars or who donates ten dollars a month or a hundred dollars a year. So, uh, so if, if if you want to be a holy man or a or a saint, that can be arranged. Uh, the old the old churches sold indulgences. How much is the pope? Um, I'd like to be a pope. I uh, see. I'm that's that's <laughs> pretty much my job. Although the my technically my my job title is thirty seventh level cleric. Okay, yeah. see that's uh, what I was asking. <laughs> see, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, cool hat. Do you have uh, any like lower level clerics or? How um, that work? Eventually, I want to, and right now I'm building the theology as a wiki at invisiblehand.church. Hand Started a religion before ours. And so Jeff has just that's joined us for the pool. This is why he's dressed this way. Um, <laughs> Nobody <laughs> got time for that. We'll put some clothes on, boy. Yeah, I don't know if everybody wants send to see that. Send Daddy back in to come stand here in a bathing suit. Oh, man. Um, she'll, get, she'll, she'll increase our viewer count. Yeah, um, it would be much better if Danny came in. For sure. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was very distracting. Yes, yes. <laughs> I did that yes. a lot. <laughs> All right, go you back on that. my eye. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, that's that was an eyesore. Wow. Anyway, um, <laughs> there's background laughter. I don't know if you guys can do that at home. I like it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, this is interesting. So, if you're a church, then all of the mm-hmm. church's um, proceeds ought to be tax free. Uh, well, I'm I'm not the church. I'm I'm just a uh, just the just the minister of it. Okay. But basically, the church doesn't pay me. Uh, it provides things, and I administer those yeah. things, and I partake of them as needed to keep myself going. But I don't own anything. Right. The church owns everything. Makes sense. Um, yeah. so that uh, so what is the church's stance on abortion? Uh, the church's stance on, on abortion is that the soul enters the body at the moment of birth when the, uh, when the flying spaghetti monster reaches out his noodly appendage to touch it, and that therefore if you want to have an abortion, it's your right. So you mentioned the flying spaghetti monster. Are you like a sect of the, what do they call the Flying Spaghetti Monster Church? We accept the Flying Spaghetti Monster. The Pastafarian. Are you a Pastafarian sect? We we accept the Flying Spaghetti Monster as an estimated prophet, but we deny his divinity. Oh, okay. (laughs) I don't think anybody is divine. What What do you think? Um, I don't think anybody is any more divine than anybody else. Well, yeah, I guess you could say that. There's some pretty divine looking women. Well, yeah. And you know, there's there's a big question as to where free will free will comes from because if you look at the universe on a macro level, it should be deterministic. It should be just particles flying around and bumping into each other. But quantum mechanics opens up the possibility of some very interesting machines, and the mind may well be a quantum computer. Uh, part of us, um, that, that would be a good explanation for free, free will. Um, and so I would not be surprised if there was part of us that was in another universe, and could you call that part the spirit? Maybe, I don't know. It might just be a very similar brain in a parallel universe where, um... I don't believe in none of that stuff. <laughs> See, I parallel universes are mathematically predicted, um, so I don't know. I don't know that they that they exist. You know, you can predict <laughs> anything mathematically if you're wrong. We put on a robe or something. Who's gonna put all of Jesus? <laughs> now you sprained my other eye. Oh, <laughs> Anybody? Yeah, there's no. a drug. We've got yes. an excellent podcast going. Let's okay. not mess yeah. up, Jeff. Maybe we should put up a taping. Don't wander I'm inside. Trying to have some culture. He, he's been, uh, he's been Jamesified. He, he's, he's even having a couple of, uh, uh, beers. Man, if this 
one is this bad. Just imagine next week at New Year's. That's what I'm saying. We need to start early. Like, yeah, yeah, we have to start week. really early for our New Year's Eve no show. Shots. <laughs> um, we're we're gonna we're probably gonna put out um, a, a short little ten minute video. Maybe we'll see. We'll do little clips of people um, giving a, some brief uh, philosophy. Sure. I think. Right side. Was on the right side. Deal with it. No more talking. So, face bomb. <laughs> he, he can't see him. He's off camera. And he doesn't really care. He has no shame. No. He's a heathen. He's a machinist. Ah. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, um. That, yeah, that, that just kind of <laughs> killed the buzz right there. Yeah, so, since the buzz just got killed, I have a, um. An interesting topic. Let me see if I can get my computer over here. I see drunk people. <laughs> 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 Alright. So, the reason I'm bringing this over here, um, I want to talk about spreading the message of freedom in any place that you can. There is this group on Facebook called Google Voluntarism Squad. What these guys do is they go out and they find posts from, you know, police organizations, political parties, just like really like dripping with status posts on Mm -hmm. Facebook. And then they grab that post and they share it into the Google Voluntarism Squad group. I'll put the link in the show notes. Um, One of the posts that they shared is this picture. I'm going to show it to you. I'll put it on the screen at home. Um, my daddy can arrest your daddy is a t-shirt that an infant is wearing in bed. That is a beautiful baby. Though. It's a beautiful baby. It's, I don't know. Yeah. I think the baby. Well, I'll tell you he's wearing what. a t-shirt that says this. Now, before we get into, you know, our thoughts on what the um, the baby's wearing, I, I, I think, obviously, we're probably all in agreement here that it's, it's an appalling thing. Well, well, it doesn't so much appall me as state the obvious, because anybody can arrest anybody. If okay. I see that kid's daddy in the middle of uh, kicking the shit out of somebody, uh, when it's unjustified, which cops are wont to yeah. do, then I do have a right to make a citizen's arrest yeah. of that police right. officer. So that, that uh, no, 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 no. That's Whether or not they'll kill me is another issue, right. and they probably will, so, so I, I might not So obviously that, that's but. not where they're going. I guess, I guess yeah. so, because that says can be a lot right, more... Right. So, right. yeah, and, and I don't want to get too deep into, like, what we think about it, because, obvious, I mean, we're, we're, we, we obviously know they're talking about cops, mm-hmm. and so, because they, they share this into the, the group, that sends everybody from the group over to the page to take over the message. And this is something that I was trying to do with the um, Worldwide Peace and Liberty Coalition. I would hashtag take over the message and send people in. And I had some pretty good success with it. But these guys are focused just on this. So I posted a comment over there. Um, and I wrote, that's horrible. My daddy can throw your daddy on the ground, chain him, force him into his car, take him to a building that can only be described as a dungeon, and force him into a cage. Should your daddy defend himself against this kidnapping, my daddy can kill him. You know who would buy this shirt? Someone who got bullied as a child and who needs to feel powerful today as a way to not feel vulnerable. Whoever buys this shirt is someone who needs psychological help to get over their need for power over others to compensate for being a victim when younger. <laughs> so I wrote that in this little statist... Um, Web page. The, the, the page is called Law Enforcement Today's Photos. I got Law Enforcement Today's Photos. And I got just under a thousand likes for that, um, that post and 106 comments. Nice. Yeah. And there were even, um, Pete, like, I went and checked out who was liking it when it was first going, and I found one person who was sharing all kinds of cop stuff. So this resonated with people far outside the, um, the anarchy slash freedom community. Mm-hmm. And I, I think this is an excellent way to do, to do outreach to new people. 
So once it got to be so popular, now my comment is gonna be at the top of, of that thread by Facebook is gonna put it there. So there's 106 comments in here and all of the people from Google Voluntarium Squad came in and I mean, we've got, let me just um, list off some of the stuff that's posted in this thread. People who've never heard of this stuff are, are now being exposed to all of these, these comments. You've got the book, Three Felonies a Day, How the Feds Target the Innocent in here. You've got the story of your enslavement by Stephen Molyneux before he jumped the shark. Um, <laughs> I mean, he did an excellent job there, and then he jumped the shark. Um, I put a link to Freedom Talk Media on there so people could... Um, oh, I didn't see that. Yeah. Um, let's see. We've got um, Tom Woods, episode 557, The State's Corruption of Private Law. That's the one I was talking about earlier in here. We've got Frederick Bastiat's The Law. That's what got me listening, by the way, to, to The Law by Frederick Bastiat. And then in between all of these things are the points that are being made on there, like all of these comments are, um, let me see if I can just quickly find one. Um, so it sounds like a pretty cool thing that uh, yeah. I haven't heard of like that. I heard of it, but I didn't know what it was. You know, somebody, really attention somebody to made the trite, terrorism. somebody made the trite comment about, you know, if you don't like police, why don't you call a crackhead? And, yeah, um, Somebody you know, I've here. always thought it, that it was you're a pretty sad group of people if the only thing you can you can compare yourself to make yourself to to make yourself look good is a crackhead. Was that your comment? And, and <laughs> that's what the person who uh, yeah, responded uh, to her that, said. That yeah, was the first that, comment was basically it's pretty fucked yeah, up if that's all you can uh, compare yourself. That, to. Yeah, right. that's exactly what was in here. I should that way when a crackhead violates my rights the same way a cop will at least people will take me seriously. What does it say about your profession when you have to compare it to a crackhead to make it seem valid? <laughs> so, that was an excellent yeah. and, point. Yeah. And you made the same exact point. Yeah, you made the same exact point. It's in there and because uh, almost a thousand people liked it and all these people commented on it, people are reading this stuff who've never been exposed to the message of anarchy That's a really before good way and freedom. To, uh, mm -hmm. to reach new people. So, yeah, you should definitely, um, I think it's a group, you should definitely consider joining the group Google Voluntarism, Voluntarism Squad and you can participate in this. You can also find these posts and put, put them in there. And, and I think it's a great way to reach out to people. Um, be, and you could take this outside of Facebook. You can go into you know, any newspaper site from traditional media and just post these kind of comments in there as a group. I mean, I've done it to actual state agencies before. One time I actually had a um, police agency take down a post of, they were proud of this seizure or whatever, I think it was a drug seizure or something. Mm -hmm. And we attacked that post. This was even before I got in this group. We attacked that post to the level that the government actually took the post down. Wow. Nice. Yeah. And there, yeah, there are also in some municipalities, they literally can't legally remove comments right. because it, it's some destruction of public records. Right. Right. Yeah. Somebody, right. somebody decided to apply to Facebook. It was yeah. like, okay. It's not the same as um, if you or I do it on our page because once the government, the government's Facebook page is like a public forum. Right. So, I mean, it's a sense of using the state's rules against itself. Yeah. And well, that's exactly what we do yeah. with, uh, with civil disobedience. Like, also, I could if probably... you go out in a park and, and do something as a form of protest, the reason you can do that is because the owner of the park is the government, the gov government has right. uh, specific, uh, has a First Amendment that says you can gather on, on their space for redress of grievance. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, and, and I've seen these threads go, and I've also seen where the government has replied nice. to, to these comments. Like, I was at the Drug Enforcement Agency of, like, New Mexico or something like that. I got into it. With them. Mm -hmm. We were going back and forth, and they're saying, like, little trite stuff, and I'm coming at them with, like, philosophy and stuff. So people who read that stuff, they're looking at me, and I'm not being combative. I'm being logical, reasonable. Mm -hmm and intelligent and they're coming at it with like trite comments and this is wrong you know what i mean it's a completely different level in when when 
people are seeing this stuff. Mm -hmm. And this is, is, when I say take over the message, what, what I mean is that for thousands of years, every method of communication that's been available to the public has eventually been co-opted by the government. When the printing press came out, it caused a revolution across Europe because the government couldn't control it at first. Mm -hmm. And eventually they, they got control of it. But at first, it, it actually destroyed the, the unification of the church and the state because um, it fractioned the church. And then in, in the process, the government couldn't unify with it. And that's what led us to our democratic republics that we're at now. The Internet is a revolution in communication technology that the government hasn't yet figured out how to control. Mm. And we are taking yeah. over the message in a way that in a speed that has never happened before. And this is why I believe that we live in a revolution right now. Mm. Yeah, we live in a, yeah, net neutrality is pretty scary. That's their attempt and they're yeah. pretty good at it, but. Well, the problem you know, is there's an old I think we live in a historical time though. Like, yeah. Absolutely. Joe said, it's, it's, you don't really realize you're living in history until after it's over, but this shit hasn't been, there's some crazy shit going on right now. There's an old saying about, uh, about censorship on the net uh, put out by one of the early libertarians who was involved in, in creating the internet. He said, the net inter interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. And yeah. that is pretty much how the internet was designed. They've somewhat, uh, they've, they've taken away that flexibility somewhat by giving, by creating a backbone for the internet that's run by the major phone companies. But all, all of our computers have the ability to form a peer to peer network. Yeah, we could, I could form an internet right here yeah. in this room. It's right. completely off of the other internet, and then if we just started stringing wires or Wi-Fi from house to house, and pretty soon you could have a whole other internet, and, and I believe this is happening in some places. So yeah. the moment the government takes over the internet, they could just make an internet too. Yeah. And, and that's part of what the dark net is, mm -hmm. is accomplishing. And there are other other projects yeah. working on that. In New Hampshire, there are people working on uh, getting uh, shortwave receivers and using them so that basically Grafton and, and Manchester and Keene will, will all be able to mm -hmm. keep in contact with each other. And, of course, once you have something like that up and running, it's, it's the very beginning that's the hardest part. Once it's up and working, other people can easily add on to yeah. it because they can see what you've done. Um, of course, the scary part about going wireless is it can be jammed, but it can be multi, um, you know, it can be wired, wireless, it can be all linked together. Um, uh, there's so many ways. Well, I guess the internet, in a way, is a is a reflection of of the market. I mean, it, you know, you can people can do whatever they can. It's kind of like a, a free market in a way. Mm -hmm. As much as pot, you know, and the government has been fighting against that to try to control it, and yeah, and that's where this all ch this child porn nonsense comes from. You know, this, what's that? Mm -hmm. Well, the government drags up the idea that there's all this child porn everywhere, and that's why they have to take over and control everything. It's just like yeah. what we were talking about in episode five with the um, the drones. You know, they oh they're a danger to airplanes, so everybody has to register their uh, their. Um, not drones. They're uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. Your RC mm -hmm. airplanes and your quadcopters and all that stuff that people have been flying for 150 years. Mm, not quite that long. Uh, when, yeah. did, when did RC airplanes come out? Um, it would have been at least in the 30s or 40s. Because... Oh, yeah, you're right. Airplanes didn't even come out until... <laughs> yeah, so... All right, so well, not 150 years. 75 years. 75 years. years. years flying these time. things, yeah. And, um... You know, they would have yeah. saved a lot of lives if they had invented the RC air airplane first and then worked on the man one. <laughs> now that I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Did they have the radio technology in, was it 1907? Oh, no, that's true. They wouldn't yeah. have had, had the radio technology. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so. Too bad. Yeah, and then that's also, this is why we're doing the Anarchy Roundtable. This is us putting out the message of freedom unfiltered 
by the government, but it's actually not even completely unfiltered because sometimes there are things that we don't say. Oh, yeah. Because Big James said, yeah, yeah, some things that we might not agree with, and yeah, there are things that you can say that um, can be considered criminal by the government. Yeah, and and so there's some things we don't say. Um, oh, it's at eight twenty-seven. So, um, in, in order to to protect ourselves from so, the violence of the state. Sure. So they, they get to us even here in, in this little room that we had. Rich, I have a question for you. It's something I'd like to do maybe in a future episode. Is um, and you've answered this in the last uh, in uh, episode five a little bit. But how can we, you know, live a positive, fruitful, happy, productive, not being angry all the time, optimistic? <laughs> This kind of rambling, uh, you know, loving life when we know that the horrors of the state are and, all around us, and, and the state. I, 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 I think we kind of feel the same way, but I also feel that chances are that, and I think you believe this too, that we're not going to see I, I, that the state is going to continue to get stronger in our lifetimes. It's going to continue to be more oppressive. So how do you live in this system without being angry and, you know, try to be productive and, and try to live a positive life? Well, first off, as the state becomes more more oppressive, it doesn't become stronger. The, the, it becomes... More oppressive. <laughs> well, it does become more oppressive, but the thing that gives... This, that makes the state able to do the things it does is this illusion of legitimacy this idea that um that you know whatever the state is does is okay and the more oppressive the state becomes the more people it harms and the more people it harms the more enemies that it makes the less legitimacy um, it has and the less legitimacy it makes uh, yeah the less legitimacy it has this is something so, I noticed when I was a child, even like bullies, most of what they got going on is that people believe that they can, you know, they believe they're afraid of them out of a belief, not necessarily out of reality. Right. Most of the time they're not going to do shit. Right. And, and most of the time if, was, if a bully steps up and you step right back to him, he's going to back off, you know. And the, the, uh, now the government is all is obviously... I mean, it's nothing new to them to have to... They actually do use violence. Okay. There's no doubt about it, and they're good at it. You know? That's what I was going to say. Um, but there's still only one uh, police or active military for every 200 people. So even imagine just a man with an AR-15 trying to control... 200 people, he's not going to hold on to that rifle for long. Yeah, yeah I agree that the, the, the power of the government is an illusion, and if nobody believed in it, or if a good percentage of people did not believe in it, that it would go away. And that is uh, yeah, that is something that uh, I think we should work for, is to to get people to understand that it's just an illusion. Well, I think, I think that's also what's important about the message I was making earlier. Yeah. Uh, our ability to control the, um, the information that gets out because so much of the power of the state comes from their ability to control information. And we talked about this mm -hmm. earlier, I think it was in episode five, um, or was it earlier in this episode? I'm starting to lose track. Mm -hmm. Um I don't know if anyone remembers <laughs> episode five. Um, um, we, we, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but anyway, we, we talked, talked about this before in that a great deal, you know, because, because of the state, state, what you just said, the state is incapable of using violence on everyone. They can only use it on the select few who can mm -hmm. escape the propaganda of the state that makes people believe that taxation is just or inevitable mm -hmm. um, and, and that it's inescapable. Um, you don't want to open that all the way because um, you get a reflection. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Right. Well, you know, actually, we are um, 
an hour into this episode. Okay. Uh, I didn't want to stop. I was just, yeah. just going to turn, turn on the lights outside. Keep well, we're going to, you know what, we're we probably will. ready to wrap up. Let's go ahead and do just another episode in a little while. If, if well, you're no, not going to do it anymore, but I do want to go soon. Just keep talking. I'm going to turn the lights on and maybe we'll We're going to go out there. Okay, keep talking. Here, come here. You're killing me. I, I actually oh, need a cigarette, bro. Yeah, but no, we're, no, not, we're all ready. Okay, we are. We're, we're, we're going to sit down and we're going to wrap this up. So, I was just going to turn the lights on no, so we could see them swimming. Um, okay, go ahead. All, all I was going to say is um, this. I think this has been a great episode. It has. And I think it's time to wrap it up. And it's December 26th, and we are in Michigan. Yay. Let's go outside and let's go swimming. And Rich. Please, we appreciate you coming and uh, talking to us. Yes. Thanks. Do you have anything else you can say in closing? Yeah. Um, close this motherfucker out. <laughs> well, I'll give you, I'll give you the traditional blessing of the of the Church of the Invisible Hand, which is may the visible boot of government kick not in thy door, nor thy teeth, nor stomp upon thy face. Ramen. <laughs> Noodles, bitches. Noodles. Noodles. <laughs>